is one that is very much prevalent in today's disrupted world and one that is on all of our radars and that is the risks brought about by, um, to organisations by the supply chain. My name is Heather Baird and I am risk manager at Redmayne Bentley, an investment management and stockbroking firm. Um, and I'll be co-hosting today with Ian Crestwell, who is Director of Risk and Technology um, at South Liverpool Homes. Sorry, Ian, did you raise your hand? Um, so we'll hear from two speakers today, um, Ross Sanson from Deloitte and Nat Jurita from Yorkshire Building Society who will talk about risk processes and supplier oversight to prompt thought into what good risk management looks like. Um, Roth will provide a broad cross-industry view and that will talk about the journey of Yorkshire Building Society managing risks in the supply chain. So we've allowed 30 minutes for each speaker, which should allow for some time at the end of the presentations for a Q&A panel. Can I just ask that um, you post any questions that you may have in the chat facility in the GoToWebinar pop-up window, which is at the top right hand of your screen, and we'll endeavour to answer as many questions as we can at the end of the presentations. So firstly, I'd like to introduce Ross Anson. Ross has worked in Deloitte's extended enterprise risk team for over 10 years, working with numerous global pharmaceutical and life sciences companies, supporting the design and implementation of third-party risk management frameworks, and becoming Deloitte's leading global expert in this subject matter for the sector. So, over to you, Ross. Thank you very much. Can I just check everyone can hear, and then um, I will show my screen, and maybe if you could just check, uh, you can see my screen as well. Yeah, I can see everything at the end. Okay, brilliant. Um, well, thank you very much. So, um, as Heather mentioned, so my name is Ross, I'm a director in Deloitte's third party risk team uh, in the UK. Uh, and over the past dozen years or so, my focus has been primarily in, in helping clients to set up, run, and manage these programs, uh, helping to uh, manage third party risk. Uh, across their supply and distribution networks, um, and primarily that's been across life sciences, pharmaceuticals, consumer, and other manufacturing-based industries. Um, so thank, thank you, Heather and Ian, for asking me to talk today. Um, I'm going to give a, a, an overview of some of the themes that we're seeing at the moment in this space, and uh, some trends that our clients are talking to us about. Um, hopefully, will be a uh, a reasonable indication of, of what others and from what yourselves on the call are seeing within your organisations. Um, talk a little bit about those trends, um, how we're seeing companies try to address this challenge, um, and then uh, talk to some of the challenges that we're seeing uh, our clients face on a, a regular basis when they get into their third party risk and supply chain risk programmes. Um, and try to give a, a bit of a insight into how we're seeing uh, those challenges be tackled. Please, uh, please do drop some questions into the chat. We're happy, more than happy, to pick them up at the end of the session. Um, so, I guess to start with, I think in, in terms of what's driving clients to look at supply chain risk, um, certainly in, in the last couple of years, there's been a bit of a move in in this. Uh, space. So probably five, ten years ago, um, third-party risk management was primarily driven by uh, the desire to protect against business interruptions and continuity challenges, and then regulator um, and, and legal pressure uh, requirements. So, so complying with regulatory requirements and avoiding business uh, interruption. The last three, four years, what we've seen much more is that uh, both investors and customers of our clients are driving them to um, to look to demonstrate a much stronger oversight of their supply chains um, because they recognize that if there's an issue in their portfolio or an issue in their own supply chain that can uh, have a reputational impact on themselves. Um, 
Um, apologies. Um, so all of that has led to a, a an additional pressure on our client to make sure that they're managing risk in their supply chain. Clearly still uh, legal compliance and, and regulatory requirements are, are a significant driver. Um, and then what we've seen again, so clearly ESG is 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 a big, big factor in, in uh, um, driving investors and, and customers to um, to put this pressure on. But clearly in the last 18 months, two years, initially with COVID and subsequently with um, the uh, the situation in the Ukraine, um, supply chain resilience is rarely out of the news for, for more than a couple of days. And so we've, we've now got um, a much broader range of challenges that clients are, are looking to make sure they're really on top of than there probably was not all that long ago. And whilst these aren't new issues, um, they've certainly come much more to the forefront of our, of our clients' minds in, in the past couple of years. And it's been really interesting that, that even with COVID um, in the last couple of years, the, the ESG agenda is really accelerating um, and it hasn't really um, slowed that down. So it's something that's clearly been talked about for quite a long time. Um, we're really seeing that come through now um, in terms of clients actually you know, leaning into it and, and trying to make sure that they've got it really well covered as part of their programs. However, although the, um, although the landscape that our clients are trying to manage is getting wider and more complicated. Um, what we see is that there are a number of fundamental things that um, that we see if you we recommend our clients try to address and make sure you have covered when you're thinking about how to manage this. And, and I suppose that the slide I've got on the page now, um, almost an executive summary of how we see uh, a good supply chain risk or third party risk management framework being set up. And where we have seen a lot of companies struggle is, is typically where um, one or more of these areas aren't clearly covered uh, and, and clearly being managed um, and that having a, a real knock on impact on um, a lot of the rest of the elements of, of the approach to third party risk management. And it's not about having necessarily a, a 300 page framework document, although um, fantastic if you do, but it is about um, being very clear how you're going to manage these areas. So I'll just spend a, a little bit of time sharing some thoughts on um, on how to go about that for in these areas and um, and then move on to some, some specifics. So I think very, very clearly um, these programs can be complicated and there can be a lot involved and the drivers for doing it as I mentioned at the start move over time having a very clear mandate uh, and set of drivers in terms of documented and approved uh, business objectives for tackling third party risk um, is is really key it helps to set um, your authority for doing it and for, um, for rolling it out into the business one of the challenges with supply chain risk management is that it, in reality, it's much broader than impacting just the supply chain team or just the procurement team. Um, it really does touch every part of the business. You need to work closely with legal, with compliance, with risk um, in order to get it rolled out. And, and it really does impact the day-to-day -day operation of, of most organizations. So being very clear um, and having a, a really senior buy-in to what a, a supply chain risk program is seeking to achieve is really important and that moves over time as I said uh, as the regulatory or geopolitical landscape moves so keeping that under review as with all of these areas um, we see it just really um, fundamental to keeping the framework current and relevant and not just becoming a time sink for the business um, and that is often a, a criticism of Third party risk framework. So when I get to the operating model piece, I'll try and give a couple of um, a couple of ideas for how to how to manage that challenge. The next two rows here, third party types and risk domains. This is about scope and, and making sure you're clear what you're trying to 
uh, tackle. So moving on from why to, to what. Um, and this will depend on how far along the, the third period risk journey you are. So some some of you on the phone, I'm sure, will have had a, a framework of some sort in place for a long time and have be pretty well covered in several areas. Um, and it's about keeping horizon scanning uh, and understanding what risk coming into the business or what you're ready to tackle next. Um, there's some examples there. There's many, many more risks that, that may impact a business. Certainly, some of the, the more recent ones that I'm seeing clients try to tackle now that they haven't done as much on previously include scope three emissions, um, which is really challenging to get uh, accurate uh, and up-to-date data on from suppliers. Um, diversity, uh, equity and inclusion is, is another which is um, coming more and more into these programs. And some of those on the screen there are more fundamental and will have been in included in a lot of third party risk programs for a long, long period of time. But being very clear on which risk areas you're trying to tackle, which you're not trying to tackle as part of your third party risk program, and being clear exactly what you mean by them. Human and labor rights, for example, is one um, where human rights, labor rights, uh, modern slavery, for example, three things that are very closely connected but mean slightly different things, uh, and just make sure that you're really clear on, on how you define the risks that you're tackling. And then moving on to the operating model. So, um, what is it that, what's the structure of our business, that, and how are we going to tackle this? And, and we see a lot of companies are getting really good at, at some of these areas, but the ones that are really succeeding with, with TPRM and supply chain risks. A, a, a clear in all of them. Um, so policies and standards, what, what do we require people to do in this space? Um, I would say m most of most companies that I see have some sort of policy around how uh, what they want people to do and probably a decent enough business process as well for how they expect people to do it. I would say that particularly goes up to the sort of risk assess and decide part of the third party life cycle there at the bottom, I would say a lot of companies now are getting pretty good at that. Much less consistently, I would say companies are, um, are less good at tying those risk assessments programs through into actually seeing through improvement and, uh, and having an impact on the supply chain, contracting with them in a way that um, requires third parties to improve as a result of negative findings, um, and then actually continuing to gain oversight and assurance of, of those third parties throughout the delivery of the services. If we think about it, obviously due diligence is key to make sure we're not taking on uh, bad third parties, if you like, or, or third parties that can't operate within our risk appetite. But actually, if they're gonna have a negative impact on you, it's gonna be why they're, whilst they're working with you. So. Um, so that manage and monitor stage of the, the uh, life cycle from a risk perspective is one where I would say I see uh, a huge opportunity for, for, for many organizations to improve. Um, and then what I would say then, they're the kind of the fundamentals, the policies and processes. But do we have um, an appropriately skilled uh, organization or, or people within the organization to deliver these services, these um, the risk assessments and risk management activities. Different organizations take different approaches to how to do it. Some centralize within a center of excellence. Clearly that's expensive uh, and, and requires a huge change management. But, uh, and, and many others decentralize it, push the risk requirements out to the business and, and some somewhere in the middle. Whichever route you go down, you, need to make sure that there's the, the people doing it are appropriately trained and and um, and capable to deliver those processes. And what I see uh, a lot is particularly in decentralized, so, so where the business is running the risk process itself and it's almost a, uh, in addition to people's day jobs, often there'll be really good policies and procedures in place, but not enough guidance on how to assess the risk and what to do when you find challenges arise. Um, and that also then goes to governance and oversight. So who is there to help make decisions and help make sure that appropriate risk decisions are taken when we do find something challenging? Um, briefly then, um, 
companies that are, are getting really good at this then are, are getting really good at um, having tools and technology in place that enable them to not just deliver at the process seamlessly. The good tools and tech can make this very, very straightforward for businesses to deliver, um, but also enable them to, to get that risk metrics piece right and, and really demonstrate a positive impact from their supply chain risk activities. Company that predominantly driven by ESG and now really trying to demonstrate that they're having a positive impact on the communities that their supply chain is working in. Um, and and there's a lot of a, a really hot market around tools and tech that enable them to do that. Um, I'll touch on that a little bit shortly. And if you can get all that in place, uh, clearly try and tackle all of that. Um, it's a pretty good foundation for, for succeeding with, with the supply chain risk program. Um, and I would suggest when we do, for example, when we help clients with um, with internal audits or current assessments, we tend to look at things under those buckets and I'm happy to share these slides. Um, I would su suggest having a look at how your organization is, is doing against these buckets around supply chain risk management. I won't um, spend too much time on, on this slide, as I say, I'm going to happily to share these, but there's some um, key thoughts really, whether you're at the start of a supply chain risk journey or um, doing a refresh or, or a, a, an annual review of, of where you stand, worth looking at um, some of these questions. Has, you know, has your, has your CEO made some statements about what you're going to do with this? Supply chain that mean you need to take action. Are there statements in the annual report? Um, have, uh, is the regulator um, putting putting more obligations on you? And certainly in the, uh, some sectors, that's been the case recently. Um, we're expecting very imminently, I think, to see some um, human rights due diligence uh, regulations come out in the EU, for example, as well. So, um, so the regulatory environment is pretty hot. Um, around around supply chain risk, and and as a result, you you know you do need to keep your framework under review uh, uh, on a regular basis. I do see a, a lot of programs um, that may have been super mature two to three years ago are kind of falling behind already as a result of that. Um, and then just moving then to how people are doing this in practice. I think one of the big themes we've seen in the last five years, I would say, is a move from reliance um, very heavily on supplier obtained data and information to using a, a range of data and information sources to assess uh, the, the risk in the supply chain. Um, so historically, you know, these programs have heavily relied on third party questionnaires uh, and, and audit. Um, more recently, uh, we've seen a lot of companies try to gain insight and, and assurance from things like open source media solutions, set specialist subscription feeds, for example, uh, the likes of BitSite or Security Scorecard um, in the cyberspace, um, Echo Vardis in the ESG space, where they, they use supply data as well as part of their solution. Um, and, and even the likes of um, Dun & Bradstreet uh, uh, for financial health has been around and in use for, for a very long time. Um, and then over to the left side of that wheel, there you see customer data and internal data. The, the strength of some of the community models out there is, um, is continuing to grow. So um, in some industries uh, such as in financial services in, in London with Helios, um, such as in the pharmaceutical sector uh, uh, globally, really, with the PSCI, the Pharmaceutical Supply Chain Initiative, um, organizations are working together to try and improve standards across their shared supply chains. Um, and that's seen as a, a positive thing, really, where industry players can move together to try and improve ESG uh, and other standards. Um, one thing we'd say, I have seen some companies try and really move away from supply data towards those feeds. Um, our perspective on this is, is that um, the third party questionnaires and audits will are, are absolutely crucial. Um, and the other data sources uh, enhance the 
quality of assessment that you're able to do. But for the higher risk suppliers, you always need to be able to assess the actual controls uh, and practices that they have in place. And so whilst they, these other sources of information can help you to narrow that down and to add uh, context and perspective to that data, um, we don't recommend that um, companies move away from uh, from actually assessing the controls in place at, at suppliers. And I think that's an important point because some companies are um, starting to talk about whether that's possible. We don't think that there's anything really out there yet that enables you to fully do that. But we do see some of these additional uh, approaches as, as extremely additive and value adding. The other thing to mention on that is a lot of some of those oops, apologies, I skipped through by mistake. Um, some of those additional data sources, um, there, there's a difference between data and information and insight. And, and um, when you take those sorts of data sources in, we do recommend have a look before you start using them, really consider what you're going to do with the results of those data feeds, how you're going to turn that into action um, so that it doesn't just become uh, noise that you don't know what to do with. And that's sometimes where um, companies are challenged when they start using those if they haven't done a bit of um, just a, a bit of a, a design uh, on how they're going to actually say, we'll take these results and, and turn those into remediation actions as an example. Um, I'm going to move on to some of the talking points that were in the invite and, and um, uh, a, just a couple of examples. Uh, so I picked four, four challenges out here and just thought I'd give some, some thoughts which I'm more than happy to answer questions on, on later in the um, discussion. Um, and, and these are challenges that I see a, a, a lot of the paddy risk supply chain risk programs do have. So. Engagement of the suppliers themselves or the third parties with the process, and this is this is always a, a challenge. Um, it's going to become um, it's going to come around again now with uh, the fact that supply chain programs are going to be playing a big part in a lot of organisations' net zero ambitions because of the importance of. Um, Scope three emissions in, in, in the total emissions of most organizations uh, and, and that data being very difficult to gather. So how do we keep suppliers uh, engaged in the process? How do we get them to share uh, proactively, ideally, but, but even responsibly, the, the information we need? Um, I think there's a few things here. So um, where this is particularly difficult is if the, if the requests for uh, control information or or, um, or or scope three data come after the point of a third party being appointed. Um, so, if you particularly for new third parties, would recommend um, doing your due diligence early in that process, so that the third party uh, has a an incentive to provide it, and you can then do your assessment as part of the selection process and build, and you have the opportunity to build any remediation requirements into your contracts. Um, that is a much, much more effective way of getting responses than, than doing it as a last minute thing before a contract can be signed or even in, in, in a lot of cases we see it happening kind of after the fact. At that point, even just the feeling of the process is that it's a tick box exercise and, and just one last hurdle to go through. So we would recommend making it part of the due diligence and selection process. Um, a lot of questionnaires and, and audit surveys are still quite long and open, and so we um, we recommend making those as straightforward to respond to as possible. Where where possible, make them multiple choice answers with attachment of evidence rather than descriptive answers. Um, that makes them both easier to respond to for suppliers and easier to actually assess for yourselves. Um, and and then one of the biggest complaints we often see is is where organizations aren't organized in the sense of knowing what they've approved and which client, uh, suppliers they've approved for what kind of assessments. So if you have a um, an approval period where you don't need to keep sending the same supplier the same questionnaires, uh, if you keep using them, make sure that that's maintained and you, you're not sending them the same question and, and, and assessments over and over again. Those kind of things absolutely 
help to, to build player engagement um, uh, and just to, to touch on internal buy-in if your if your people are fully brought into the processes that helps no end as well um, I'll talk quickly about uh, ongoing assurance um, so um, I mentioned the use of intelligence that's growing but in addition to that audit I think are, are getting um, more attention than previously and these are clearly can be expensive and can be time consuming and potentially onerous or seen as onerous um, the most effective audit programs I see are, are ones that use the data that companies have on their supply chain to inform selection and to target what you're auditing each supplier for um, so that you can really narrow down the focus make those as efficient and impactful as possible um, two more slight um, two more themes that were in, that were mentioned in, in the um, in the notes uh, that went out so resilience um, is, is right at the forefront now and this is a this is um, something that companies are really talking about as a, as a trade-off ultimately a lot of companies would have sought a lean cost-effective uh, supply chain for a long long period of time and now there are significant um, continuity and resilience challenges in, in a lot of supply chains. And what we're looking at effectively now is a, a, a trade-off discussion between cost effectiveness and, and leanness um, versus resilience. So having a think about what really are the critical uh, services that could s slow down or stop our business, um, what are our most important products, and identifying for those do we need to further diversify our supply chain? That's not easy, it's not quick to do, and it needs to be part of a strategic program. Um, there are some things you can do in the shorter term, clearly, such as um, build up a larger buffer stock in challenging times. Um, and, and that is part of a discussion, not just about risk, but also about operational um, efficiency that, that clients are, are looking to have at the moment. Uh, and, and in the worst case scenario that there is a major disruption or change, are you prepared? Have you got in place um, clear plans, response plans, so that you can respond and recover very quickly if something happens? Um, and so if you're looking at, um, at risk and if you're looking to audit or, or, or review what you have in place around resilience, um, certainly looking at that is, is you know, and what's in place in, in those particular areas is, a, is certainly a good thing to do. Um, and, and finally, um, one that I, I thought worth touching on, um, supply, you know, supply chain is a, is a very broad term and a broad church in, in, in many ways. Um, there are some clients will be international global contracts. So many in the tail will be very local and, and fairly transactional. Um, some, some points on, on that, I think really important to assess the third party at a legal entity level and where they're delivering services for you. Um, some some organizations sort of fall into the trap and rely on where the entity is, is registered, which may be very different to where they're serving you. Um, and even at some risk domains, that may need assessments to be done at a site level. Um, and you need to look for each risk domain, what, what's driving the risk? Is it the factory itself or is it the entity? Um, that becomes clearly very challenging where you've got a global entity that may be operating hundreds of sites for you. And so what we do see are some clients looking to put in place a, uh, a special process for those kind of strategic and priority clients, uh, sorry, suppliers, where they take them outside of their normal process uh, and perform group level global assessments, where they do look at some of the higher risk geographies that they're being served in, but they don't look at every single Signed necessarily. Um, the last thing I was going to just mention, um, because my, my half hour is up, it, if you are looking to um, audit or, or look at a uh, uh, how well you're managing um, supply chain risk across the organisation, um, I've got some notes here on things to look at, and I'll just go back effectively to the um, to the notes on the first uh, on the framework summary that we had, how, how well are you set up and how clearly have you defined your approach in all of those areas 
Uh, so governance, operating model, policies and procedures. Is it clear who needs to do the activities and who needs to take the decisions? Um, uh, and, and have we got appropriate and effective supporting tools and technologies in place? Um, all of that will help you to look at the design and then you can look at specific cases, specific geographies to look at how well it's been executed in practice. Um, and then you look at the audit and, and there are there is plenty of information out there but even at a contract by contract level, the opportunity for savings and operational effectiveness from doing that well is really significant. Um, so hopefully a, a helpful whistle stop tour at a broad level of some of the themes we're seeing at a, an overarching level and then in some specific areas. Um, I, will, I will pause there and maybe hand back to Heather and Ian um, to, to hand on to that. Thank you very much, Ross. Um, so Nat, uh, Nat Jurita is up next. Um, Nat currently heads up the supply chain at Yorkshire Building Society. Um, she's responsible for sourcing and purchasing, um, supply relationship management and third party risk management. Um, over the past two years, she's transformed the third party risk management across the society, improving the understanding of the supplier materiality, high risk factors, and most recently implementing the regulatory changes to the policy. Um, she's also previously worked for the Department of Health as a senior leader in the procurement for function, delivering transformation projects. And um, so once again, um, please post any questions in the chat and we'll endeavour to get them answered at the end. Um, so I'm going to, due to technical reasons, I'm going to share the screen on behalf of Nat. So I'll just bear with me and I'll get that up for you. Over to you, Nat. There we go, can you hear me? Okay, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Oh dear, I'm often muted on, on purpose. <laughs> and, and you might you might want to do it again in half an hour. Um, brilliant, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Heather, for that introduction. Um, and thank you for offering to drive the slides as well. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm Nat Jarita. I am the head of supply chain at Yorkshire Building Society. Um, and as Heather said in, in, in the bio there, um, supply chain here covers um, it's both first line operation and also first line risk function. So we look after all purchasing um, and sourcing and um, we are also the centre of expertise, if you like, for all things supplier related. Um, so I am just going to ask you to move on to the, the first um, slide from Heather and I um, will just chat you through. So, um, some of the things I'll, I'll talk about will absolutely cross over with with what Ross has said, but hopefully it will all be useful, useful builds for, for everyone. Um, and, and I think Ross did reflect on it, but I think it's fair to say that third party risk management has really picked up pace um, in recent years. And I think since the pandemic, you know, it's become the hot topic of discussion in, in many boardrooms and certainly is at, at the Yorkshire. Um, so today I wanted to share some personal experiences on that and what it's like working within the building society and the financial services industry for those of you um, that are not in that sector hopefully it will be um, insightful. Um, I took up post in February 2022 so just prior to work uh, to lockdown um, at the time the director of recruiting was looking for someone with both change and supply chain background um, and that's because they, they'd identified quite a significant requirement to transform and upgrade supplier relationship management across the organisation. So um, the function at the time had been really heavily audited both internally and externally. Um, significant regulatory change coming down the pipeline and, and we identified essentially that um, third party risk management capability, it, it needed a complete overhaul to make sure that we were able to be regulatory compliant in the future. Um, I think at the time, if I'm honest, most people managing suppliers, they enjoyed the partnership and you know all the perks that used to come with working with suppliers. And I think that that posed probably the biggest shift that we needed to make, moving away from solely focusing on the people and the relationships and actually putting a lot more focus on outcomes and the risks of those partnerships. Um, 
financial services leaders, for those of you not, not in the sector, actually regulated themselves, um, and that's through something called senior manager regime. Um, and the regime describes the functions of a business, the accountabilities within that function, and then who should actually be accountable for those things. And role holders actually have personal liability for those accountabilities. So, you know, if found to be in misconduct or failing to carry out the duties effectively, they can face criminal prosecution. Um, and that can actually come many years after they've left left company. So it's not just whilst they're in role. Um, that's pertinent for, for me because supplier management is actually an accountability of something called senior manager function 24. Um, and that is the chief operating officers area. Um, at YBS, that is delegated to um, what is called the Director of Shared Service and Resilience, and my role aligns into, into there. So I'm essentially um, accountable for maintaining those, those responsibilities. Um, and I think, you know, that, that is quite tricky, um, in particular with a devolved third party risk model, which is what we've got in the organisation. Um, I think also the understanding of third party risk and what it actually is, is quite a significant challenge. Um, probably the best way I would describe that, um, and, and Ross touched on it, is that it's not a thing in itself. Um, so instead, it's actually an umbrella term for many different risk domains, um, all of which businesses are typically used to assessing internal resources against. Um, however, as we know, external resources, you know, some of those lenses actually pose a greater risk than others. I tend to think about that, I guess, as in, you know, if you if you're working within a fort, you know, within the fort walls of a castle, you can protect your own resources. But the moment you build a door or a bridge to the outside world, then that poses a weakness and a risk or risks. And it's those things that in third party risk space that you need to be identifying and understanding. Um, you can see at the bottom right hand side there in the slide as well, that there's a bit of a timeline and that just articulates some of the triggers that we've had for changes in recent years. Um, so it did actually start with the um, some regulatory change coming down the line um, and internally then assessing how we might deliver that. That then identified the need for the upgrade. Um, this was at the highest level of the organisation. So as Ross said, in terms of where that mandate was coming, it was coming from our highest board level risk committee um, and, and still is today, you know, one of our sort of tier one policies and I regularly have to provide reporting and updates and deep, deep dives on, on risk management into what we call our group risk committee. As I say, that is um, board level chair, chaired by uh, non-executive directors. If I just talk you through a little bit around the framework that we've implemented um, and what that actually includes, how, how we operationalise that. So it starts off with um, supplier risk assessment. So some of that is obviously done through the procurement process in that initial due diligence. But at the point that we know roughly who we want to work with and what it is that we want to purchase products or services, um, we have a detailed risk assessment. We call it a, a risk triage assessment. And the reason we call it a risk triage assessment is because it is also the conduit to categorising suppliers at Yorkshire Building Society. So we only categorise them by the risks that they pose. We don't look at any other um, lens value, etc. cetera. Um, it is only based around the risk. Um, that in itself is quite a lengthy document. And um, I think Ross, you did reflect on that as well about these things being quite cumbersome. We're continually looking at ways to improve that and, and make that better. Um, but I think we're no different to most other organisations um, in that context. It's quite difficult trying to find the right tool. The biggest feedback and challenge that we get from people is that that punches out into those different risk domains then for further detailed analysis so if you say you know yes we're going to be sharing data that then punches out into a new tool and does a new you know data impact assessment um so if we've got circa sort of 15 risk lenses that that, that triage assesses if you said yes to all of those and the chances are that you're going to have to go and do 15 other risk assessments uh, more detailed risk assessments so it is very cumbersome, but it does do the job. In terms of risk categorisation, we've got five main categories. Starts off with transactional, so effectively we're saying no risk, we're not concerned about them. We don't put them on the framework. Um, if it's low risk, 
um, they will be on the framework, but they've got reduced controls that um, we would be asking the organisation or the SRM to be evidencing. Um, we have a medium risk, then you jump into the high risk category, which is split out into two. So that's split out into material third parties and material outsource relationships. Um, material outsource relationships, we have to report to the regulator, the PRA, and the PRA have a say in whether we can um, sign contracts with material outsource organisations. They're also very interested in material third party relationships. A lot of that at the moment is being driven by cloud and the growth in, 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 that, in that cloud space. Once we've onboarded a supplier, we know what the category is then we will onboard them onto the framework. And depending on that category, then there'll be a different um, level of due diligence ongoing that we would overlay. Um, we do use a system and we ask our SRMs to routinely um, evidence controls within that system and also to routinely go in and score the evidence. So for example, you might say yes to, I have a business continuity plan with this third party, but it's not where it needs to be. So you wouldn't get a green score, you'd be scoring it as a medium and then we'd know that there's work needed to be done on it, ready, so there's no business continuity plan. And we do that, as I say, across sort of 13, 15 len uh, risk lenses, risk controls. Um, there's a lot of reporting comes off of the back of that. Um, there is an assurance process as part of the framework that my team support will talk about that in a little bit more detail um, shortly. Um, since implementing that framework, um, a lot of change has been on the back of um, the PRA's um, revision of their own outsourcing policy, driven very much by the European Banking Authority and the changes that they were pushing out across Europe. Um, that has involved updates to the framework, updates to processes, contract remediation. Um, and I think probably the most significant impact has been around um, their expectation on testing exit plans and also ensuring that audit rights are being acted upon. There's been a bit of a shift, I think, in, in financial services in the past sort of three years in terms of where the PRA thought organisations were around um, operational resilience and managing third parties. So they're really putting kind of a lot of pressure on organisations now to evidence to them that they are doing these things. Um, testing exit plans is a challenge in itself. A lot of organisations that I talk to across the top of my peer groups, this is a, a big area that they are worried about because obviously it's quite involved. It involves time on the supplier's part as well. I don't think anybody's yet cracked the nut around how we go about doing that. Um, test, yeah, putting audits in place, etc. those things are um, tried and tested and there's lots of partnerships that, that um, exist out there to help with that. But the exit plans piece is a little bit more of a um, uncharted water, if you like. Um, so I've mentioned operation resilience as well, which again, you know, last year, big regulatory change, Ross touched on it, um, and it, it, it has a significant dependency on third parties, in particular within the Archer Building Society, because, you know, over the years, obviously, there's been a push to be, become lean, and as a result of becoming lean, you rely on third parties to support the delivery of what you do a lot, a lot more than what, you know, you may have done in the past. So understanding where those critical services are, and actually the definition of critical is, is up to you. You have to define it and get it right for you as an organisation. Um, but understanding what those critical services are and then which suppliers can materially impact that critical service, because there'll be lots of suppliers that influence it in some way, but can they materially impact that service and potentially cause customer detriment? Those are all the sorts of things that we've been, we've been thinking about in that space. Heather, I'm going to move on to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so as you can see from that timeline that we've just talked about, change is uh, constant. Um, and that can actually pose a real challenge if you are working across an organisation and trying to galvanise change constantly across many different people and reporting lines. But change in this space, in supplier um, management, it, it, you know, it's a constant. And I think that change capability and flexibility are actually the keys to ensuring that your third party risk management framework practices don't just become a tick box exercise and that they continue to drive 
good risk outcomes. Um, now, we are definitely not 100% successful in that yet at YBS. Um, and it's something that, you know, within supply chain, within that central function, we have to work really, really hard at all of the time to maintain. Um, I think the important starting point is to recognise how engaged your supplier relationship managers actually are in third party risk management. As I said at the start, they had a very different mindset around what managing a relationship actually looked like. Um, and we've made some really good progress on it. So, you know, it's just that we're not probably where we need to be just yet. Um, our single biggest challenge, I think, is the model itself for SRM. Um, and there isn't one. Um, so some business areas have good practice with specific people on point for managing relationships. They'll have a role profile. They probably chose to do the role, which is a big, big help. Um, however, across many of the business functions um, at YBS, it's still very much a, a side of the desk responsibility. I think typically what happens is we engage with a third party to help us deliver, you know, outcomes, objectives, but we're not necessarily thinking about what that then means in terms of the management of that relationship. Um, and that might sound a bit strange, um, or, or rather it might sound strange to say it's outside of my control, um, but I am trying to do something about it, building a case for change, because I do think this is a fundamental part of, of making sure that there is a legacy around that framework and that it sticks. So if I disappear and the team disappear, um, is it fully embedded? without those roles, without people seeing it as part of their, you know, their job and what they're paid to do, it, it would be less sticky, put it that way. Um, so yeah, we are we're looking at the roles and responsibilities across the organization, trying to make sure that people are doing doing the SRM, doing the risk management bit because they want to, you know, they chose that job. Um, it's a specific role. They recognize the value in doing doing that. But actually, at the moment, I have to recognise that that's not where we are. And so there are constraints to third party risk management. Um, and it means that, you know, we as a team have to put a lot more effort into just making sure that we've got that organisational grip and control. Um, I mentioned before, we do have an assurance process and it is a strong assurance process. We kicked that off within within supply chain originally, and that has now been handed off to an actual assurance function. Um, the reason we handed it off is because we are there to try and help supply relationship managers um, achieve the best possible outcomes. And actually, it was acting as a barrier because the business saw as more of a police type um, function. Whereas, obviously, assurance teams already have the reputation around good assurance and good processes and um, people expect um, you know, them to be doing that assurance role. So that's helped a lot. Um, the assurance itself looks at um, both the quality of the controls. So I, I mentioned the business continuity plans before. Have they uploaded a blank document and called it a business continuity plan? Um, is the business continuity plan any good? You know, does it make sense? Has it been tested? When was it last reviewed? Um, and also, are they actually scoring their current position on that control correctly? Um, we have spent quite a bit of time actually listening to colleague feedback around how the framework works and how the controls are applied. Are they proportionate to the level of risk that a supplier actually poses to the organisation? Um, I think originally we um, approached the rollout as a one size fits all um, based on timing. You know, we needed to get it out there. But now we're very much reflective of that to make sure that it's proportionate and that people are engaged with it. If they don't feel it's proportionate, they're not engaging with it. So listening to the feedback, making changes has really, really helped to gain the support of, of SRMs out in the business. Um, I think, you know, colleague engagement in general, it, it, it does improve directly as an output of continuous improvement. That's probably true for, for most business functions. Um, but it's not just about keeping abreast of changes to risk exposure or, or new emerging risks um, and responding to those. I think it's also just recognising, you know, that we are on a journey um, and that, you know, there are two ways to make that third party risk management better. And that is both looking at the external influences to change, but making sure that we are constantly listening to the feedback of people in the business. So I've talked quite a bit about regulatory change, so I won't labour too much on that point. But I think it is 
an inter interesting one from financial services that you know my peers that are working in banks who are multinational um they will attest to the difficulties i guess of working across multiple regimes and trying to maintain effective efficient frameworks you know that are proportionate when a lot of those changes don't often often align um so within the archer building society we're, we're not multinational so we take our lead from the uk regulators um it is difficult but it's much easier having to only respond to uk regulators and i think the last point is perhaps the most important one so you know flexibility um and I'm sure you all know, you know, you can prepare and have the best risk management framework, but it, it will never be enough. Um, so you've got to be flexible um, and be able to, you know, respond quickly to the risks that become issues. And um, just highlighting a few examples there. Obviously, we all are familiar with um, with at least two of these. But what was interesting for me is pre-pandemic, you know, I've got friends on an NHS trust one week before lockdown were saying that, you know, it's not something that they were worried about. And a week later, you know, my team and all the business are working from home and we're trying to assess what that means for, for our supply chain. Um, and then, you know, not so, not so long ago, sat eating my breakfast, doing my emails, watching the news, people interviewing Ukrainian members of the public who were really relaxed about, about the threats. And the next day, obviously, invasion and supply chains and the teams are just impacted all over the world. So very quickly, despite sometimes the, the warning flags, these things um, take hold. Um, and then the last one I think is interesting because you know, two years ago, cyber threat is probably the one thing that we were talking about from a financial services perspective as being the real threat. Um, but again, even in that space where it is a real threat, it, it you know, it can catch us off guard. Um, and I think the SEPA um, example, you know, where they were significantly attacked on Christmas Eve is a really good example of, you know, we're, we're all humans and the guard goes down and, and something terrible can happen. So it really is about how flexible you can be and quick to, to respond to those changes. Um, I'm just conscious of time, so I'll move on to, um, to slide three. Um, so in terms of um, just, just wrapping up really, um, I think part and parcel of the brief was around thinking about, you know, how do you, um, you engage suppliers in your um, third party risk management? Um, and I think it's really important, I, I mentioned it before, it starts in the procurement process, um, but it isn't necessarily about assessing whether um, they meet your criteria or the certain um, risk domains. I think it's also equally important to understand what the culture of that organisation is and how seriously they take risk management um, and being able to evaluate how well they apply their own um, risk management practices, how competent they are in talking to you about those. Um, in particular, where um, we're now focusing on material third parties and material outsource, we're also trying to understand the downstream supply chain and whether you know we might have a medium rated supplier, but actually they've got a material fourth party, um, and and really trying to understand whether they recognise that and how they're managing the risks of the fourth parties or their third parties rather that they're working with. But I think there's probably some useful principles as I've, as I've put on the slide, um, and there'll be more. There'll be more than this, um, but these are certainly things that I always come back to. Um, so knowing why you know those suppliers want to work with you as an organisation, um, you know, is it purposeful? You know, is the relationship going to be purposeful, and can you can you put your trust in in that organisation? Does it does it feel right? Um, setting clear standards for what you expect and making those public because if they are public they can see that before they enter into um, into procurement exercises into our RFPs. Um, third party risk management um, in the procurement process at the moment for us is um, still quite manual but we are looking at ways to automate that we are working with as, as Ross mentioned um, a company called Helios we haven't operationalised that tool yet. Um, we use it more on an ad hoc basis, but certainly we are seeing some of my peers across other organisations are using that to help inform their evaluation of, of suppliers coming into processes. The, the big is don't make silly requests. No one understand the, the supplier themselves. 
um, certainly with some of the big strategic IT suppliers, you are not going to get actual hands-on documents that you expect. Um, so you have to be um, more innovative about how you address your needs and concerns. Um, also, you know, know what their limitations are. So from an audit perspective, you know, I'll give you an example. We've got one relationship at the moment where they do a lot of work for the MOD, you know, and we were asking to have access to their systems. It's just never going to happen. Um, so try not to make silly requests, always make the request purposeful and help the third party to understand what the value for you is in, in asking for um, the evidence around uh, risk management. Trying to be collaborative um, as much as possible, I think is, um, is really key. Um, so, you know, there are tools, as we said, Helios is, is a really great tool for um, collaboration where you're minimising the amount of work that the third party has to do because it's once and done for them and all their clients can tap into the same information. But also being collaborative around um, how you address your, your risks and concerns. Um, and also ensuring that, you know, within the contract, you're not hampering your ability to exercise the rights over risk management. Um, and that they are going to be fully cooperative on things that you need them need them to be. Um, the point around behaviour, I think, is has been a lesson learned for for me definitely um, in terms of how a supplier behaves and engages. If they think your priority is around value, and therefore you know they're going to get time with your most senior executives because you're spending a lot of money with them, the behaviour is very different to if you're telling them. You're a priority for us because we see you as carrying the most greatest risk and when you're going in to talk to our CEO we'd like you to remember that so it really does drive a different behavior and priority from your supplier um, and yeah equally a couple of really important points just just to finish off on your frame of reference often will just be yourself and they're obviously facing off into many organizations so coming back to that collaborative point, they may have really valid ideas um, and innovative ways to help you to address your um, risk, um, issue, risk and issues um, because of what they're seeing, what they're being asked to do with, with other with other suppliers, sorry, other clients. Um, and today, you know, actually because of the um, importance of data and the regulation around data, you can often be just as much of a, a risk to them as, as they are to you. So it's really trying to understand what that two-way two risk exposure piece is. So that's all I was going to cover. And I have just about met my 30-minute criteria. Um, so I will hand back to, to Heather. But thank you so much for, for letting me share our experiences at YBS. Great. Thanks, Nat. And thanks, both of you, for, for sharing your experiences and your insights today. It's been really valuable. Um, we have had some questions through. Um, Ian, if I can hand over to you. Yeah, OK. Uh, thanks to everybody who's posted questions uh, in the panel. Um, the fair few uh, arrived during Ross's presentation. So uh, if I could ask Ross to answer these first couple. Um, do you find there's a significant difference between the private and public sectors with supply chain management? And that came from Stephen Dando. Thank you, Stephen, for asking that question. Um, it, yes, uh, in the sense of obviously some of the, the frameworks and the, the, the stringent frameworks, I guess, for, for public sector procurement that are that are in place. But in, in terms of um, say so that in, in terms of the pro procurement itself, but it, in terms of the uh, actual risk management priorities and, and, and some of the uh, impact that you can see, um, I, I think I, th I think less so. Um, I think within the public sector, from what I know, I've not done masses of, of public sector work, but where I have worked with public sector clients, I see that they're still looking at the same challenges there. Um, looking to understand the same sort of information from from clients uh, uh, from suppliers sorry and actually they still have very strong um uh relationships with their suppliers where where they're looking to um to develop the same uh, the same sort of uh, risk assessment processes i think um some of the public sector could probably use some of the centralized uh, you know probably centralize some of those activities a, li a little 
better from what I've seen, but I have to have to admit I, I've not done tons and tons of work in the in the public sector. Okay, thank you, Ross. Uh, I think you sort of covered this on your last slide, but I'll, I'll ask it anyway. And um, thanks to Adrian Clements, who's asked a, asked a number of questions uh, in the chat. Um, recent events highlight that the supply chain exposure is not only single source, but aggregating consequences over geocentric nodes or commonality. How are you suggesting to capture these aggregations and concentrations? Yeah, no, thank you. Um, yes, it is challenging. And I think one of the big things here is really understanding your supply chain, which is uh, sounds probably simpler than it is in reality. A lot of organizations have an awful lot of data about their suppliers, but it's in an awful lot of different systems. It's um, And it's not very easy to actually get hold of that information or really understand where your suppliers are working for you. Um, and so I'd say the first thing is really getting a grip on that, really understanding the data, and, and probably a lot of companies won't have it, so get, gathering it, understanding where your supply chain is. And for some critical and, and more important product lines or, or services, that will include going down the chain as well and, and understanding down to tier four, tier five, and, and beyond, um, even down to individual mines or farms, you know, depending on what your supply chain looks like and which industry you sit in. So I think that understanding it is a big first step, which, which not everybody has. Um, and then, as, a, as I mentioned on the, the, the last slide there, I think for some of those global and, and key suppliers, there's a, there's a balance, clearly. Um, and understanding where which of those sites are, are the most important things happening in which of those sites do you need to go and look at individually versus which can you rely on group level um group level activities and that that will depend a little bit on on the industry and the risk domains um but also i think for um for, for some of these supply chains it, again it it does keep going back to um you, you really need to un understand very, very well what they're doing and where those risks are opposed to you. Yeah, okay. Uh, next question is from Russell Heppelston, uh, specifically relating, uh, relating to Ukraine. So uh, thanks, Ross, for that really insightful presentation. Uh, just wondering what you're seeing exploring some of the key challenges in supply chain risk resulting from the conflict in Ukraine. Uh, clearly, resilience will be key, but are you seeing anything specific? Um, yeah, re resilient and, and trying to understand. I'd, I'd say the biggest thing that I'm getting requests for is around export controls and sanctions. Uh, we have a, you know, a, a lot of clients will have operations in Russia or the Ukraine suppliers there, or Belarus as well is obviously a big, a big thing. And um, companies are, are really trying to get to grips with what it means for their supply chain and some of that comes down to not just directly sanctioned by but, but also sanctioned by extension and um for you know for, for companies who aren't monitoring things like um ownership and associations of their um third parties in those high risk regions um that's posed a kind of immediate challenge of understanding it, you know what can they continue to do, but also who can they continue to work with? Um, and so there's been a bit of a scramble to get, get arms around that as well. Yep. Okay, thank you, Ross. Uh, I'll open this up to both of you, actually, if it's okay, uh, to Ross and Nat. Um, is it mandatory to mention the business continuity related clauses in third party contractual agreements uh, before engaging with them uh, in the organization? Now, do you want to take that one? Certainly, FS is stricter on that. Yeah, um, yeah. Short answer is um, yes. So, um, is it is it mandatory to mention it beforehand? Um, probably not. But I think in terms of our material third parties and material outsourcers, they are the most strategic organisations. So they're working across FS. Um, they know and understand what the what the guidelines and regulation actually is. Many of them are working directly with the regulators, so they they do typically understand the requirement. But it is mandated to have it in there. 
Okay, thank you, Nat. Um, the, the, these last two questions that are, that are in the uh, in the chat uh, oh, uh, uh, appear during your presentation, Nat. So I'll uh, I'll ask you to answer them first, and then uh, Ross can chip in if necessary. Um, it's been noted that a significant driver of TPRM is compliance, but as risk management is a risk is a risk risk and opportunity. And what are the opportunities and value creation, and how are these assessed and valued? I wouldn't say that we were there yet in our maturity, um, and that that is because we're we're only really just into the second year of the framework being implemented. Um, so much of what we've been doing is about getting control um, and not necessarily maturing that into that next phase where, where we'll be looking at those opportunities. And also much of our time has been spent reacting to some of those big, big, you know, um, external factors and also the regulatory change. Um, but it is, it's absolutely there on the maturity plan, definitely. Okay. I think um, it's, it's, uh, it's one of the big questions I, I see when we kind of get asked to help clients with this and at the start and they're trying to make business case, the, uh, articulating the value of something that hasn't happened yet or stopping something from happening is clearly more challenging than if there's a direct return on investment. Um, but a, a few things I've seen really interesting recently, um, more and more clients or um, companies we've seen are linking things like cost recovery programs, procurement cost recovery programs to their broader supply chain risk activities and using them to fund them uh, and using that as you know an ROI of a broader third party management program um, so so taking those together uh, and turning the third party management into almost a profit making exercise that also helps to manage the overall risk so that that's been um, particularly interesting and then um, in very decentralized organizations so where the business is doing a lot of the third party risk activity and a couple of clients who have tried to build centers of excellence internally have spent a lot of time and effort trying to put a value on the, um, if you like, the cost of that side of desk activity and what it, the, you know, the opportunity cost of that of the business running those exercises. They've got a couple of thoughts that um, hopefully are helpful. Great. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Ross. Uh, uh, this one, uh, I think you touched on this, Matt, in your presentation. But uh, the penultimate uh, question on the on the uh, the panel is: um, a big part of risk management is behaviour change and company culture. Uh, so, what's the time? What is the time and coaching time split between soft skill improvement and documentation? Mm. <laughs> um, yes, that is a really good question. Um, I'll, I'll I'll try and answer it with with a bit of reality. So, you know, I mentioned that for us, you've got quite a number of people that are doing it at the side of the desk. Um, and quite a lot of our suppliers are actually categorised as low risk suppliers, which means that we don't expect them to evidence controls quite as frequently as we would do with the others. So actually, um, coming back to my point about acknowledging where you are, I have to accept that a good proportion of my team's time will be spent re-coaching um, you know, reset one to one, going through the system, going through the controls, because they're not doing it frequently enough to retain the knowledge around how they do those things. Um, the documentation, there was a massive uplift of documentation and learning materials at the start of implementing the framework. Um, and we review that on an annual basis now. Um, that said, there'll be ad hoc reviews as and when we get we get feedback as well. Um, but I'd say most of our time is spent in that coaching space. And like I said, you know, being completely transparent, we're not there yet in terms of making this stuff stick. If we were not there, you know, then a large part of this would fall away. So we are still trying to fix that through the maturity plan around getting this to be self-sufficient in the business and make sure culturally people are seeing this not just as part of their role, but they see the value in doing it and they understand why managing the suppliers in that way is so important. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you, Nat. A uh, couple more questions just popped up since you've been speaking. So uh, one specifically uh, for you, Ross. So uh, interesting point from Ross around cost recovery and ROI. Um, could Ross give us an example of how the cost recovery program works with the third party risk piece? Is that through contract lifecycle management or question mark? 
Yeah, exactly. So um, doing things like, you know, I talked a fair bit about really understanding your supply chain, what they're doing for you, and as part of that understanding who's got really complicated um, billing and performance mechanisms in the contract and therefore um, would be most likely to have misbilled it most of the time when, when we are involved in that kind of stuff it's completely accidental because the, com the clause is just so complicated that um, people don't really understand them or, or, or whatever so it, it's it's just including that in understanding the third party population identifying um, you know nominations for for um, for audit and then effectively having the um, governance and the program mandate set up so that the recoveries from those kind of programs are, are used as part of the budget and, and for funding TPRM activities, which um, which is you know goes a long way to making the case for um, for more focus to be put on put on the activities that need to happen. And exactly, yeah, through through the country through understanding third parties and, and using the contract. So you should have strong audit clauses, for example, particularly where you've got complex or difficult um, difficult engagements. Okay, thank you, Ross. Uh, I'll, I'll open this question up to, bo to both of you, both Nas and Ross. Um, any advice on how to overcome the barriers to suppliers being digitally integrated to share ver verifiable production progress on projects where project visibility is crucial due to the integrated nature of deliveries? To the overall project success. So, question around digital barriers. Any experience? I'm not sure I understand that fully, Ian. To be honest. Yeah. So, is there is there is there a, is there a point about uh, some of the supply chain not being digitally integrated with with, with your organisations, and, and that could become a barrier to project success? Yeah. Well, from experience, we're, we're not digital, you know, in it, a lot of our processes are currently quite manual. Um, I don't think it acts as a barrier. It probably does hinder both the performance of the third party and, you, you know, yourselves in terms of getting that, that project over the line. Um, and I don't think that there is enough, um, hopefully this is answering the question, but I don't, I don't think there's enough um, emphasis put on the time it takes for suppliers to engage in processes you know and the cost to a, a supplier um, and that's certainly something that I'm trying to push at the moment through the procurement processes just to be mindful of you know it costs suppliers a lot to engage in a process so we need to be thinking about how we make it efficient and effective in the absence of you know being able to digitally connect with them. Thank you and uh, we've got another one Another question pop up uh, from Gemma Durham. Um, with regards to the surveys and not repeating questions, how often and what basis do you change? The and what is the meaning of obtaining internal buy-in? Okay, from Gemma. So I think so, certainly the surveys are driven by um, not necessarily continuous improvement, but much more around the external drivers. Um, we do, I, I definitely don't see organisationally us reducing risks um, or, or the risk exposure on certain risk, risk domains. Actually, it's, it's the opposite, if anything, and we're constantly adding in more risks that need, need to be assessed. Um, I think that that is the key piece in terms of where your processes are manual and certainly what we, we're experiencing at the moment is it's so difficult to make those efficient for people to be able to complete when they are manual and you're constantly layering in new things to consider and, and assess, which is why, and I think Ross, you touched on it in your presentation, that shift to um, digital tools and external data is really, really key. And I, I think there will come a, there come a crunch point, certainly for YBS and I'm sure other organisations where you physically cannot get the quality of risk assessment, let alone you know all of the assessment done that you want, want to be done. So you are going to be forced to go externally for some of that information. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think the um, it's certainly important at, at a minimum to be um sending out new surveys when the third party starts 
doing something new for you certainly um and and for the higher risk third parties you want to you do want to be reassessing them relatively regularly but there are, are things you can do as that said about around digitization um to, to make that more straightforward for them um if you have and again this does differ somewhat by risk domain and and industry but if you have risk domains uh, where you are comfortable to rely on, say, a legal entity's assessment for a period of time, say, one year, two years, three years, if as long as they pass it and you're comfortable with it, um, then I think it's really helpful to just be organised and make sure you've got a clear record of of that and, and that you have a way to enable people to identify that so they don't keep sending out, you know, this third party send, answered the data privacy questionnaire last year for the exact same scope of services down the road or, or whatever. You know, that, that kind of thing does does make a big, big impact on how um, how onerous it, it is or isn't to support a, cli a company's third party risk program. Yeah, okay. Jerry's just popped another question uh, as well. Would you perform the same financial due diligence each year, for example, or ask different questions? Yeah, we do at the moment. It doesn't matter what level of uh, risk they pose. We only have the capability to assess their stability through one um, means. Um, so we are, I've got a project going on at the moment to look at working with some external third parties to try and um, ensure that certainly for material third parties and material outsources, we can get a deeper understanding of their, their financial stability. But at the moment, I'd say it's not adequate enough. Great, thank you, Nat. Um, there's no further questions uh, in the panel. Uh, Heather, do you want to wrap up or do you want me to close? Um, no, that's fine, I can do it. So once again, thank you to Ross and Nat for presenting to us today and thank you all for listening in. Um, the Northwest Regional Group is working on our next event, which potentially will be an in-person event. Um, so just thank you all for joining. Thank you. Yeah. Thank just, you. Thank you. Just, just thank about you. Them. We'll be on the IRM regional website as well, so we will load them on. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Nas, and thank you, Ross. I know how busy you are. That was really. No problem. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Very much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.